Hey everybody, how's it going? So today I'd like to answer a question that I get very often. Today it came from Max Kopstein. He said, I don't mean to sound rude, but big corporations paying lobbyists to push legislature that screws over the public isn't news. It hasn't been news for about as long as I can remember. I'm 22. So while I agree with everything you said, I don't need to hear it again. What I need are strategies. What can I, an average citizen, do about it that doesn't require me to give up all of my career goals and become a full-time politician? Every time I ask this, the only answer I get is make sure you vote for the right people, but I've been doing that every chance I get and it doesn't seem to fucking help. So the most helpful thing you could do for someone like me is to inform me of what my options are to combat corporate influence in politics like we see here, because right now it feels like we're all just fucked and there's nothing to be done about it. Of course, I'm still going to vote. That's the least I owe my country for all the opportunities it's given me. This is an excellent question. So to be clear, this is something I answered in a really long-winded fashion about two years ago in this video titled The Real Right to Repair, and I will link that video below. Thank you, Blackberry. Now, in that video, the TLDR of it is that when I go to these hearings, when I publish or stream them and I comment on them, I'm not going to these hearings because I actually expect the legislation to get passed. I'm doing it as a public service because I think it is important that when people make things up and argue in very bad faith and make very bad arguments, that people should know who is making those arguments and they should hear them and they should also, more importantly, understand who it is that's swayed by them. So who are the politicians that are swayed by it? Who are making these bad arguments? What companies do they work for? Who is funding them? And above all, what are these terrible arguments? So that when I, because when I, when I went in 2015 to speak in, a, in Albany, I posted a video about it, but at the time I was too stupid to bring a recorder with me. You also weren't allowed to, I'm sure I probably could have found a way around it, but the, you know, I, I, was, I wasn't thinking straight because I thought that this was something where you argue in good faith, I know. Silly me, silly, inexperienced mid-20s Lewis. But I decided to show up and I talk about how one of the lobbyists was saying that when I do the stuff that I do, I am turning, you know, I'm turning the Mac into a PC and I'm misrepresenting it as a Mac to my customer, which is fraud. And that this was something that some of the more old and out of touch representatives, for a lack of a better way to put it, the OK Boomer types, were told. And since nobody else was showing up to tell them otherwise, they actually thought that's the way it worked. So I said, the next time I go to one of these, screw that, I'm bringing a camera so that we can catch what your name is, what company you work for, and what your crap argument is. Whether you're saying that a magtrometer is going to make the microwave explode, or that if I fix uh, you know, your, your washing machine that it, I'm going to break it and it's going to turn on without the latch and your kids are going to, you know, all this kind of rubbish and nonsense where they pretend that you don't need permits and licenses to do business like or any of this stuff. Uh, you know, I want you to hear what it is they have to say because what they have to say is in many ways complete and utter bullshit. And I, I refute it because, you know, what the hell, but I don't even need to refute it. I simply record it and I play it, and that in and of itself is good enough for most people to realize, wow, they have no idea what they're talking about. And then when the bill doesn't pass, you get to look at the politicians that were there and go, wow, those people fell for it. But at the end of the day, I'm not doing it because I expect the bill to pass. I simply want you to ha have a window into the process that currently exists. The real right to repair is going to be in helping people to find what it is we do fun, interesting and economically motivating. So what do I mean by that? So people should find it fun to get the fan to spin again. People should find it fun after two hours of working on a long screw damaged iPhone to see the Apple logo pop up on the screen. When AP LCM reset goes high and the screen shows up, it's like, yes, yes. That is the feeling that you need to impart onto other people. Because once somebody has that feeling, they are never going to be an anti-repair individual, nor are they ever going to want to take that away from somebody else. When you allow somebody who is broke and destitute, who needs this to work for their job, to pay $50 to $100 to get something to work, rather than $700 to $1,500 to get it to work, that person will never be anti-repair. When you get somebody who has a shitty job at a crappy retail store to 
find a job for themselves where they're making two to three times as much money or, or they get off welfare because now they are working in this industry where they get to make people happy, save them money, get their data back, and get to make more money than they used to before, you've got somebody for life. This is what matters. Getting people to find what we do interesting, uh, economically motivating, and fun. That is what I seek to do. Because what I believe is that when people decide to become interns, engineers, project managers, executives, board members at these businesses, that they are going to remember these experiences if they grew up with it as part of their culture. Not just, I saw this video today as a 40 or 50 year old person, so I'm just going to, you know, change the culture of my entire company. That, that's not going to happen. I mean, if the new generation shows up to work and they have this work ethic ground into their heads because they grew up around it and they thought it was amazing and it was a part of their life, then, and only then, is the tide going to turn. So for me, the real right to repair is not the legislative process. That part is political theater, and for the most part, it's a joke. I went to testify in one of the most progressive parts of the United States, and in a few weeks, you're going to hear that that bill failed because somebody talked about how the children and the washing machine and what if people who don't have licenses and an unvetted work on this, even though there is more than ample evidence for the past 50 to 70 years that you need a license to do this to begin with. They made the worst arguments in bad faith. And in just a few weeks time, you're going to hear the most progressive city in the country say, we have no interest in this bill and it's not going to get passed. I know that that's what's going to happen. When we, when we showed up there, you watched a panel of politicians stare at their phone. They had more than five times as many questions for the individuals that were lobbying against the bill than they did people who were lobbying in favor of the bill. The decision was made before we actually got there. It doesn't matter if I showed up. It doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't matter if I get a round of applause. It doesn't matter if we destroy every single one of their arguments every time we show up. It's going to have the exact same way every single time. The reality is that if you want to make long-lasting change, real change, the way you make that change is you get people's minds to change and you get the culture to change all together so that once those people are in the positions that their predecessors were in, they start to make different decisions. They're not going to make that decision that they made prior. When somebody is put in a position where they're told by somebody, oh, by the way, so just so that those repair shops can't get access to this, make sure that the firmware in this chip kills itself if they try to read it. When you do that and you have a design team of people literally walk out of your building because they find that so repulsive and disgusting because they grew up watching Chris Long and Tim Herman and Mark Schaefer and Jessa Jones and me doing this stuff while they were, you know, while they were in school sitting through some terrible, boring, repetitive class taught by somebody that just wasn't into teaching. And they were actually really involved in this. They said, man, when I grow up, I want to do that. That's fun. That's exciting. When they become engineers, when they become designers, when they become board members, they are going to shame and shame the people that asked them to do those things. That is what I think is going to happen. So if you really want to get involved, it's not simply about casting your vote putting an upvote on Reddit, voting at the voting booth, and then hoping that something happens. Because even if you vote for the politician that claims they're going to do something, either A, the politician can change their mind after they're elected. So even if you vote for somebody because you want a specific policy enacted and they say, I'm going to get the policy enacted, they go, ha, gotcha, and not even bother going for it when they get in office, or B, they could actually care to create that change, but there could be so many administrative, bureaucratic barriers to that change within the government of your country that it never happens. So the best way to get it to happen is not to try and get the law passed that forces people to act a certain way. Rather, it's to encourage a new generation of people that simply want to act the way that the law is trying to force the current people to act as is. The thing is, this is not going to be a process that happens quickly. However, neither is legislation. You could work at it for 5, 10, 15 years, probably the same thing's going to happen. I've been talking about right to repair stuff now for about five and a half years. There has been virtually no progress. 
there's one law in the European Union that's related to home appliances that has nothing to do with what we do. But for the most part, when it comes legally to what we do, there's been, in my, in my estimation, virtually no progress whatsoever. However, where I've seen lots of progress is in what normal people think of repair, what the next generation thinks of repair, what people who are taking jobs at startups think of what it is we do. Changing those people, I shouldn't even say changing, I should say inspiring those people to find what we do interesting, fun, and economically viable to them so that when they are in positions to make choices that affect us, they decide to make the right choice, that is the way to go. And the way you do that is by getting people into repair. Maybe you save somebody money when they wouldn't have had money to buy a new one. Maybe you get someone to get the fan to spin or the Apple logo to show up or the wheel to spin on their buffet or whatever it is. And you show them how this would not have been possible if things ran the way companies like Apple would want them to go, where there's no parts availability, where there's no schematics availability, where everything is just sealed and you don't touch it. You get people hooked on the idea that this is interesting. And you're not going to do it by pushing it down their throats. You're not going to do it the PETA way of trying to get people to go vegetarian, because I think that that way is, is awful. You know, you're not going to lecture people and put them down. You're simply going to put in front of them the best tasting vegan burrito with the best carrot habanero hot sauce they've ever had in their life and say, but eh, try this. I know you used to Taco Bell ship. Try this. You don't convince somebody to, tr to try a vegetarian item by telling them they're a piece of shit for who they are. You get them to try it by just presenting them something better. And you're not going to get people to care about repair by lecturing them. You're not going to get what we do to, uh, you're not going to get what we do and what we're advocating for by a law, in my opinion. It's just going get, to keep getting pushed off, pushed down, and it's never going to happen. But you do get it by showing lots of ordinary people that someday will be investors, will be on the boards of these companies, will be in the design teams of these companies, will be engineering for these companies, will be advertising for these companies, will be customers of these companies and choosing which one they want to do business with to find what we do valuable. And once people value what it is we do, then you won't need a law. You won't need a politician to force through a law that's going to ask people to stop being assholes, to stop being dicks, to stop, you know, taking all the toys out of their sandbox and going home the moment someone says, I would like access to an ISL 9240 so that I can fix a MacBook that costs $3,000 and get the customer's data back. It's just going to be something that they, it's, you're not going to have to force them to twist their arm. They're simply going to want to do it. So that's probably not the answer that you are looking for. That's probably not the answer most people want to hear. But it's what I believe in. And it's the reason that I try to make what I do accessible. It's why I try to make it fun. It's try, why I try to make it interesting. I remember back in 2010 and 11 and 12 looking for videos related to what we do in my field. And I would watch them. There was actually some really good tutors out of India that were making chip level repair videos. And I could see where they were coming from in terms of how they were wanting to teach. But at the same time, I just remember watching this thinking, this is never going to get a widespread audience of people that find it interesting. At best, you're going to have some small repair shop owners that decide, you know, I may be able to get something out of this. And once they learn whatever they learn, they're done with it. I try to make what we do palatable to as many people as possible. I want you to understand how cool it is to see that your A1286 from 2010 doesn't kernel panic anymore. I want you to see how cool it is when your A20-2936 no longer has quarter fan spin because you figured out how to fix the current sensing circuit on your own. I want to include you, and I want you to also find the process to be uh, like this kind of uh, shared detective story that you got to play a role in. And I also want it to be interactive where you can be a part of it on your own and you can find your own puzzles just the way I do. And then once I've done that, I've got you hooked. And once I've got you hooked, you may be able to get somebody else hooked. And once enough of you are hooked, I'm not going to have to care about whether a politician is twiddling on his fucking iPhone when people who've paid $2,000 to show up to testify, who only get 180 seconds to make their fucking case, are there speaking to care that you're not listening to them because you're twiddling with your phone. I'm not going to have to care about that anymore because the companies are going to be staffed by people who simply voluntarily decide, 
I'm not going to be a colossal dick today. I'm going to be a normal dick today. I'm going to be 90% of a dick today, but I'm not going to be the 100% of a dick that keeps Lewis from getting access to an ISL 9240. So that, that, that's my answer to that. And it's probably not the answer most people want to hear, but it's what I believe in. It's what wakes me up in the morning. It's what inspires me to continue making videos when I already have over 500 videos going over virtually every issue you're going to encounter on a board in my industry. It's what makes me excited to do what I do. It's what makes me excited when I see the subscriber count go up because if I didn't think that I was having this effect, it wouldn't make a difference to me if I had 10 subscribers versus a million. And it's uh, it's why I, it's why I do the traveling, and that's it for today. And as always, I hope you learned something.